There were, though, modernists throughout Europe who could not and would not ignore the realities of modern urban life, its tensions and its contradictions. After all, most of them lived and worked in cities. And the modes of expression developed by the Cubists proved extremely good at rendering the spirit of urban life, not only in its, its edginess, but in its pleasures, its excitements, its electricity. Speeding automobile. Dynamism of a soccer player. Flight of a swallow. Cubism was literally propelled across the canvas by the work of the Italian futurists. This is Boccioni's impression of a football player in motion. Excited by speed and movement, they wanted to capture the impact of modern life on all the senses. The futurist fascination with dynamism and movement reached a remarkable climax here in Boccioni's unique forms of continuity in space. Boccioni claimed to have found in this work pure plastic rhythm, not the construction of the body, but the construction of the action of the body. It is also, of course, an image of faith in the power of modern man to storm the future. But the futurists were not simply experimenting with form. Their work was the manifestation of the most political of all the avant-garde groups, though on the authoritarian right rather than the Marxist left. Their leader, Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, hated the past. He wanted to drag Italy into the 20th century with violence. One of his slogans was, War, Soul Hygiene of the World. The themes of war and an impending apocalypse can be found in the work of many artists of this time, but their roots lay in the 19th century. As the 19th century progressed, many writers and thinkers, among them the visionary German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, came to believe that European culture was in a desperate crisis, that its beliefs and institutions were on the point of dissolution, and that a period of war and revolution would follow, fought out on a hitherto unimaginable scale by the mass armies of the industrial West. These kind of ideas came to occupy the thoughts of artists too. Among them, Vasily Kandinsky. This is Kandinsky's apocalyptic composition number six, painted in 1913. Two years before, in Munich, Kandinsky had formed a new group of artists, Der Blauer Reiter, the Blue Horseman. This theme of an impending apocalypse was a central concern not only of Kandinsky, but of Blauer Reiter artist Franz Marc. Here in Kandinsky, it's expressed in a mystical abstraction. But the explicit meaning, conveyed in the metaphor of a great animal disaster, comes out in Franz Marc's Fates of Animals, painted in 1913. Predictably, this painting has often been treated as a prophecy of the Great War, out of which came the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the creation of Weimar Germany, and the Russian Revolution of 1917. It was, remarkably, as the war claimed its victims, that Kazimir Malevich in Russia developed his own kind of mystical abstraction. This work, Red Square, was painted in 1915 and was part of a sequence of works, often more complex, which he called suprematist. For him, these colored shapes floating in white, infinite spaces could convey the awe of religious experience he, like the other mystics who put their faith in abstraction, kept aloof from the real apocalypse of 1914. In Kandinsky's words, when religion, science, and morality are shaken, when the external supports threaten to collapse, then man's gaze turns away from the outside world toward himself.
When the Great War ended in November 1918, there can have been few people who did not hope that the terrible losses and suffering which it had brought might be somehow redeemed in a happier post-war world with more just societies and where nations might live perhaps even in harmony with each other. But in fact, the history of the 20 years in between the two world wars, the subject of this program, is one of increasing division and disillusionment in Western culture. The advances made towards more egalitarian social order were countered by economic collapse in Europe, by civil wars, and by the growing specter of fascism, and the utopian hopes born of the tragedies of the First War dissolved eventually in totalitarian nightmare. And in the story of the art of the West, the legacy of the Great War is also a troubled one. This is a picture of hell, a vision of grotesque dead men, a swarm of possessed human beasts sailing downhill into destruction. This is how George Gross saw Berlin in his work Funeral Procession of 1918, a city on the verge of chaos. In France, the sequel to victory was a period of stability. In this new era of reconstruction, many artists who'd been involved with Cubism before 1914 injected into their work a new realism and order. Fernand Léger was one of these. His painting, Mechanical Elements, is an image of the machine not as destroyer, but as the precise yet infinitely powerful tool with which a new France would be built. It was at this point that Picasso remade his links with the classical past. And Matisse continued to paint untroubled evocations of life in the south of France. In Germany, the sequel to defeat was revolution, a bitter struggle between nationalists and revolutionaries. Gross's observations of nationalist brutality made him one of the left's most powerful propagandists. I felt the ground shaking beneath my feet, he said, and the shaking was visible in my work. His caricatures of Weimar Germany are a bitter rejection of a society depraved by greed and power. Gross's contempt was shared by wider artistic developments in Europe and America. Those developments became known as Dada. <laughs> Dada was like a storm that broke over the world of art. It had many centers, from Zurich to Hanover, from Cologne to New York, and many sorts of artistic expression. Unlike Gross in Berlin, these Dada artists didn't see the exposure of class divisions as their central purpose. They attacked the very foundations on which nations were built. Truth, beauty, reason, and science, and in the wake of the catastrophe, all these values were brought into question. In Paris and New York, Marcel Duchamp produced his ready-mades, a hat stand, a bottle rack. Ordinary everyday items promoted to the status of art objects simply because the artist had signed them. And by signing this urinal and wanting to show it as a piece of sculpture, Duchamp had pierced the whole body of Western art with ridicule. Yet despite the international activities of the Dadaists, they were running against the tide. 